been a tremendous honor for me to be here today. A high honor to have this opportunity to speak. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my dear friend of 35 years, maybe 36, maybe 34, I'm thinking 35, who has a distinguished service uh, record as a public servant, as our state representative. I think frankness describes Dennis Ross. I called Dennis within hours of hearing that Adam Putnam would not seek re-election to Congress. I said, Dennis, we need you. I thought about it. I sat there. I was sitting right down at 500 South Florida Avenue after I got a call and said, listen, Adam's not going to run again. I said, I don't live in the district, and I'm not going to move to run. I got a perfectly good house. I like where I live. I'm not in the district, but I'm going to start thinking. I'm going to think about who we should ask to run, who we should encourage to run, who we should recruit. After maybe two hours, maybe three hours, it really hit me, and I said, you know, I need to call Dennis. And I called Dennis, and I said, you, you need to think about this. And he said, I have been. You know, I didn't know this was going to happen, but I have been thinking about it. Dennis is a great guy, great family man, Lakeland boy, born and bred. He will not trade our freedom and our liberties for a little bit of security. God bless all of you, and God bless America. Dennis Ross. Yeah. Good evening, Lakeland. Yeah. And God bless every one of you for being out here tonight. Yeah. What a great crowd. Neil, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Neil didn't mention he also dated my wife before she was my wife, so. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we both share the same uh, appreciation for good women. Hey, good evening. Let me tell you something. A year ago, I stood here with you guys when we started to, our march to take back what was rightfully ours. A lot's happened in the last year. We've had a lot of triumphs and we've had some setbacks. You know, we had um, probably millions of people across this country realize that under our Constitution they have the right to peaceably assemble and to petition and protest their government. And we saw something in the last year since this movement started We've found that there's a groundswell of majority conservatives out there that want to see a change in this country. The course we're on is not the change we bargained for. Ladies and gentlemen, people are starting to listen. In Virginia, the Virginians elected a conservative governor against all odds in a state that went greatly democratic in 2008. In New Jersey, the citizens there elected a governor, Governor Christie, who today has said no more to taxing and spending of government. Yeah. There's a parallel there. The same taxing and spending that got New Jersey in trouble is getting our country in trouble. And ladies and gentlemen, in Massachusetts, the home of the late Senator Ted Kennedy, the people have now taken back the people's seat. You see, in the last year, our voices are being heard. And it's interesting it's how we're being heard because, yeah, we're using Twitter, we're using Facebook, we're using email, we're using cell phones, moms and dads, homemakers and home builders, and everybody's getting together and they're saying enough is enough. We don't want to see it anymore. We don't want to hear it anymore. We want to hold you accountable, and you need to come to us. We saw last year that when Congress came home during their break, there were town hall meetings after town hall meetings where the people got a chance to speak their mind and say, no, we don't want more government control. No, we don't want one-sixth of our economy to be controlled by the government and our health care. And people started to, to, to mobilize. And we've done it peaceably, yet assertively. So where have we come to today? Well, you know, it's interesting because as I look back at American history and I see the American spirit that held the ground there at Bunker Hill, the American spirit that secured liberty at Appomattox, and the American spirit that told the evil empire, tear this wall down, I believe that that American spirit is here today and it's living in the future. I am profoundly optimistic about. But what we have out there is to make sure that we have the resolve to take that American spirit and do what we are going to be challenged to do every day until Election Day. And that's to get practicing conservatives elected. 
You know, I want to start this future look with three words. Repeal and replace. And let me be perfectly clear when I say repeal and replace. Repeal and replace does not mean that American citizens go without health care. Repeal and replace does not mean that the elderly, the needy, the children go without health care because they have pre-existing conditions. Repeal and replace doesn't mean insurance companies now start making your decisions as to the medical necessity of your health care when that should be left up to your doctor. No, 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 no. You see, repeal and replace means taking a step back and asking yourself if there are 1,200 insurance carriers in the, in the United States that sell health insurance, why do only five sell in the state of Florida? That's not competition. That's coercion. Why can't we buy policies across state lines? When this Congress sends to us a bill on health care that says you must, by law, purchase health care insurance, but oh, by the way, we will not let you buy a policy that's affordable for you with what you want that's sold in another state. That shows that this Congress and this President not only did not read the bill, but do not understand our Constitution. You see, we got to do some things if we're going to do health care right. First of all, we need competition. We need competition amongst insurance carriers to make sure they're competing for your business. You know, in the health care bill we got out there today, there isn't one thing that addresses costs other than increasing costs. I will tell you one of the first things we ought to do to address costs is let's look at tort reform. Let's look at a system where the loser pays so that doctors can discontinue paying defensive medicine costs. Let's look at a system that rewards wellness. You know, we bailed out irresponsible behavior on Wall Street. We bailed out irresponsible behavior with auto unions. We bailed out irresponsible behavior with insurance companies and banks. Now we're going to bail out people that have irresponsible decisions about their own lifestyle. If you don't know them, you don't know anything about them, and you're taking care of your lifestyle, and you're going to pay for them. That's wrong. It's contrary to the conservative principles that we believe in personal responsibility. It goes hand in hand with individual freedoms. You see, the last thing that repeal and play, replace means is that we need to make sure we do not fund 16,000 additional IRS agents that can be empowered to harass you if you're not doing what President Obama wants you to do. Yeah. Health care. We have the greatest health care in this world. And I have to give credit to Mr. Dennis Miller that I talked to out there earlier, and he said, Mr. Ross, he said, if they had passed this health care bill when Truman was president, we would still have the iron lung, we would still have no cure for polio, we would still have probably some of the most antiquated medical procedures ever. But our country leads this world in technology and medical science. And yet we are now, in the words of astronaut um, uh, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, we are on a road to mediocrity in health care. And we will all suffer from that. Let's look at something else in our future. Probably the most important thing, because health care has kind of taken us off the ball. We kind of looked the other side. Because the most important thing that we have right now facing us is the creation and establishment of sustainable private sector jobs. 13% unemployment in this county. I was born and raised here and we didn't have that kind of unemployment. What are we doing? Let me tell you what we're doing. We spent $784 billion on a stimulus package and lost $2.7 million private jobs. We have created more thousands upon thousands of government sector jobs since then while private sector jobs have gone by the wayside. It's about jobs. It's about sustainable jobs. It was Abraham Lincoln who said you don't boost up the wage earner by punishing the wage payer. Let's look at a couple of things we could do. Let's eliminate the capital gains tax. We've got to incentivize capital back into this market.